Hello, and welcome to What's Your Story? Today I have a great guest for you, Mr. Paul Campanella. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Now, Paul is, well, he's just so talented. He does a lot of things. He's a musician, he's an actor, and also a producer, and uh, you do a lot of training with people, too, don't yes, you? Yes, I coach actors, um, and I direct uh, short films. We've done a couple short films. and. I did a feature film which won an award. So, All right, um, tell us about that. Um, well, this was a, a, a really a, a project of love, so to speak. Uh, I had worked at Tony and Tina's wedding for many years here on the Strip. Oh, you and, did? And, what um, did you do there? I played Anthony Nunzio Sr., oh. Tony's father. I see, okay. <laughs> so, and in that cast, we had great actors who could do a lot of improvisation. And one of the actors created a character named Tyler Lumpkin. And Tyler was this very interesting character. He was a genius, but he had the speech impediment. So we decided to uh, write a script or write a storyline, I should say, uh, about this character. And it was called Tyler Lumpkin, CEO. And it's a case of mistaken identity. Uh, and we hired all the actors that could do improvisation because mm -hmm. we didn't actually write a script. We just wrote a storyline with about 21 beats to ah, it. Ah, so you needed some good improv people. Exactly. So uh, we did it. We finished it. I submitted it to several film festivals around the country. And in Chicago, we won the, uh, the we were nominated for Best Film, Best Actor, and Best Screenplay, even though there was, technically wasn't a Isn't screenplay. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and we won the uh, runner-up for Best Film. So that that's wonderful. Congratulations yeah. to you. you. Well, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. So how did you get started in all of this? Well, uh, all my life I've been a musician, singer, mm -hmm. and I've always been interested in acting. And in my probably my late 20s, early 30s, I took some acting classes back in my hometown in Buffalo, New York. And uh, when I came out here, it was right at that moment in time where my intention was to try and get a showroom show, you know. But it was right at the time that um, the whole four wall thing came into play. Yes, yes. And it was totally out of reach. So what happened was is I got a little sidetracked and I started to audition for Tony and Tina's Wedding as an example and some small independent films. So um, that started me on the acting thing and that's really where I got started here until I could start building up a, sort of a resume and start making some moves into performing live, yes. which is what I love to do. Um, and then we just progressed from there and eventually I, my dream came true. I got a residency on the Strip at the House of Blues in Mandalay Bay. Oh, So I was there for three did, years. And what did you do there? I did a show called From Memphis to Motown. Mm. Uh, and it's, uh, I go on stage and I perform with a band and we do uh, Motown classics, Memphis soul, a little bit of Delta blues. But it's more of a, a show type of format as opposed to just going up and playing songs. Yes, yes. I talk a lot to the audience, a lot of partici audience participation, a couple sidetrack little stories that I tell uh, about certain songs, and, um, and one little piece of interesting information that's on my resume, which is that I can recite the story of Cinderella backwards. You can? <laughs> yes. No, so that's seriously. part of the show. You mm -hmm. can actually do that. Yes. That's amazing. And why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why I did it. I actually specifically threw it on my resume for acting uh -huh. to see if casting directors would notice it. Even if they, if they read the whole thing? Exactly. Yeah. Well, one time in an audition, a casting director noticed it, and I had just finished the audition and started to leave. And she said, oh, wait a minute, it says here on your resume you can recite Cinderella backwards. I said, yeah. She goes, could I hear it? I said, sure. So I did it. Didn't get the job, <laughs> but I made everybody in the room laugh, and that was it. Did she think you were going to recite whatever else you did backwards? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's how that got started. Yeah. What is your biggest accomplishment? Uh, well, I think getting that residency, because that was the, really the goal of my first moving here. It took me 12 years to do it. You know, so um, getting the residency, I was there for three years. Um, so that, I think, and also, uh, as far as acting is concerned, um, probably working with some really big names in the business. Um, I've done work with scenes with Kevin Hart, 
and think I love like a man Kevin too. Hart. He's a sweetheart. He's an absolute. Is joy he as nice around. in person? Oh, he's crazy. He's just absolutely. His energy level is beyond comprehension. It really is. He's a great guy. Um, so I did that. Um, I worked with Michael Madsen and mm -hmm. C. Thomas Howell in a, in a movie called Dirty Dealing, which is now on Amazon. They were both great. You know, loved having to work with them. I worked with uh, Kevin James on Mall Cop, uh, Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, when we filmed here at the uh, Wynn. And uh, he was great. We had a mutual friend, another stand-up comic, and we, we chatted about him and had a great time on set with him, just one day on set with him. So, yeah, th those are probably, you know, the top of the tier as far as that's concerned. But hopefully, I haven't reached that yet. Hopefully, there's something coming up yes. that's even going to be better. There will be. <laughs> I hope so. There will be. Um, you know, we used to have a lot of uh, filming done here in Vegas. Um, I, after I left Wendy Ward, after I thought I was too good for it anymore and I knew everything, I went and opened my own model agency and, and school, and uh, one of the branches of it, we did booking for movies. Mm. And we used to have all kinds of movies here. We did like Gauntlet, and we did all kinds of... Uh, BJ and the Bears, and uh, we had the Vegas series going on at right. that time, yes, okay. you know, and uh, Corvette Summer with Mark Hamill, and you know, just, I mean, Mark Harmon, yeah. and uh, there were just so many films being done here, we were right. constantly booking, but we don't seem to have that many anymore, but you seem to be working, so, I mean, are you, are you getting work out of Los Angeles, booking for here, or mm -hmm. are there really booking agents here where you can work? Well, um, most of the work here is independent film, so it's, it's the local filmmakers that are mm -hmm. doing their thing, um, and you're right, a while ago there was a lot of filmmaking here. When I first arrived, uh, the... Um, third installment of the oceans series mm -hmm. with george clooney right. they were filming i got on that set uh, as background um rocky balboa the movie yes. was filming here yes. and those were sort of that sort of the end of that period where there was a lot of filming going right. on hopefully it's going to pick up with mark Wahlberg's move here because Mark is interested in opening a studio or having some studios build facilities here. Like it Sony. seems like this is the perfect place yeah. for it. Well, here's the thing. I mean, Las Vegas, you know, it's not just this desert casino town. You can This can play as any city in Arizona yes. or New Mexico or Utah. You know, we can, we can do all of that. Plus, if you get the right studios for interiors, you can do whatever you want there. Um, you know, we've got the, the beautiful weather all year long. Um, so that's a big advantage. And I think, you know, I think eventually it's going to happen because I think Mark's going to have a big influence on that as well. And Nicolas Cage as well. Oh, I love Nicolas yeah. Cage. He's yeah. so good. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. He gives 100% and everything. Yeah, they no. both do. They're great. Is he planning to be here? Nicholas lives here. He's lived here for many years. I, I knew he yeah. lived here, but I didn't know that he was planning to do a... a well, yeah, he, he testified in front of the uh, state assembly a couple of years ago regarding putting together film incentive packages because that's mm. what we're missing right now. Yeah. We're missing a really, we have one, but it's not near the level of, say, Louisiana or New Mexico right. or Georgia. Georgia's the biggest right now. Well, we used to have Nevada Motion Pictures was mm -hmm. here, and uh, we had, had the Screen Actors Guild and the Screen Extras Guild and mm -hmm. all of that. I don't hear anything about that anymore. Well, there's a Screen Actors Guild, obviously, that's a national organization. Yeah, so but do they still have a chapter here? here no, they, they closed the chapter here a few years ago, but I do believe we have a representative mm -hmm. from here. But we don't actually have a chapter. Um, and today, of course, they just announced the strike. So, oh, I didn't hear. Yeah, that I've literally been... just happened before I got here. So Wow, yeah, we've been locked up in here all day. We didn't, yeah. we didn't hear any of that. And so how will that affect you with your work? Well, um, until the strike is resolved, no actor who's a SAG member can work. Yeah, I, I know. So, so everything is going to be that, along with the fact that there's a writer strike simultaneously, um, pretty, pretty much brings everything to a halt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you do production as mm -hmm. well. Yes. So uh, when you're not busy d being a star or <laughs> doing music, then you're also doing production. Right. Yeah. Do you have a production house here in Vegas? Or I, I, have a, I have a company. It's mm -hmm. called 231 Productions, LLC. And mainly we're focused on a few things. Uh, services for actors, which means I do a lot of um, video audition services for actors who need to send in self-tapes for their auditions right? because that's pretty much how everything's done now since COVID they pretty much stopped in-person auditions unfortunately yes uh, in some places it's coming back a little bit but pretty much 
I'd say 95% of the auditions are done through self-tapes. So I coach actors in self-tapes. I film it. I edit it. I upload it for them. I also produce customized reels for actors where, where we write very short scenes, maybe 25, 30 seconds. And it's designed to showcase that particular actor so that they can get those to casting directors and potential booking agents because they want to see what you look like and sound yes. like on camera. Yes. And if you don't have footage from projects you've done, or if you have footage and it's not high quality, this solves that problem. So I produce that. And then I work with actors uh, in my weekly classes. So I, we, I coach actors in the classes, so we do that. Uh, and then once we do do an actual project, for the most part, it's usually a short film. Mm. Um, again, so I can showcase the actors that I'm working right. with, something yeah. like that. Now, if I wanted to be an actor mm -hmm. and I wanted to study with you, how would I go about doing that? Well, you would contact me first, obviously. I usually do a video consultation where I, I connect with you on a video chat. And we discuss, you know, your goals, your career, what you want to do. I explain what it is I do with the system that I teach. And then we set up um, our first session, which, again, would be on video because it's mostly a lecture. It's, it's teaching the actor the system itself. Mm -hmm. Here's what it is. I send out through email all the documents they need. They print it out. And then we go through everything, and I teach them the system. And then from that point on, it's in person in the classes. I see. Yeah. I see. I understand that as men get older, they get better and they get more parts. But as women get older, they get worse or fall apart or whatever you want to describe it. And yeah. they don't get as many. Is that true? Um, I'm sure that many of the women in the business would, would agree with that in the sense of their age works against them, unfortunately, because there are some phenomenal actors who are 60, 70, whatever. I mean, look at Judy Dench. Yeah, oh, I love her. You know, so it, it is unfortunate. What's unfortunate is that those parts aren't being written because there is an audience for that, you know. Um, everyday life, we meet people of all ages, sizes, mm -hmm. ethnicities, right? So it's unfortunate that, that those parts are not being written, you know. Um, but I think hopefully that's going to get better in the future, maybe with this new... SAG contract, there might be something in there that, you know, has right. something to do with that. I don't know. But um, it is unfortunate that, that that seems to be the case with, with female actors. Yeah. I remember when we did the Vegas series here, I, uh, I did a lot of the booking for it and uh, picked out people I thought were just right. They mm -hmm. were just really good. Now, I don't know if acting has changed that much in a few years or what, but it's now on at noon on one of the other channels, the Vegas series. Right. And I happened to turn it on the other day and was watching some of the kids that used to work for me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, that's not good, you know? <laughs> and back then I thought these guys were just great, yeah, right? Yeah. But I think acting has changed. It, back then it seemed more like they were acting, whereas right. now you see actors and they seem more real. Exactly, yeah. I think over time, you know, you learn from the past, right? Mm -hmm. um, you look at the great actors who, who, in many cases, we think do nothing. You know, they're masters of stillness. Um, Anthony Hopkins comes to mind. Yes, you know? yes. He can say so much without saying anything. There's a great story about Denzel Washington um, doing the Book of Eli, and when they sat down to, um, to go through the script, he had pulled out 15 pages of his own dialogue. You know, he said, I can do that with a look. You know? Amazing. Yeah. So, and with the technology and the advancement of camera technology mm -hmm. as well, um, I tell my my students, if you think it, the camera will see it. You know. So just you don't have to do something. You don't have to push your performance to the camera. Let it come to you. You know. And and once they discover that technique, it's kind of an eye opener. You know, their performances, in my opinion, become that much better and more powerful. Um, brand new, a perfect example, um, Jim Caviezel in the new film, The Sound of F uh, Freedom. Oh, I love that movie. Oh, my goodness. His performance is all right here uh -huh. without saying a word. You yeah. Know? It's just brilliant. It really is. Oh, he had some facial expressions in that movie mm -hmm. that just told you everything. Exactly. It was just, uh, it was just amazing. Yeah. I rem I'm not even sure which scene it was, but I remember his face at one point when he turned and he looked like, 
what? Yeah. You know, it was just <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. And all the emotion, it's right there, you know, without being overly emotion and overly doing it. Again, bringing the audience to you, the actor, and your emotions and feelings as opposed to trying to push them out through the camera. Because that becomes obvious when you said they were acting. Yes, right? yeah. I joke in the class that no acting is allowed. Yeah, <laughs> There's yeah. no acting allowed Because here. you you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of it comes to with new actors who are nervous. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're on camera for the first time yeah. or, or you're just not comfortable there. I know even here in this environment, sometimes I had one poor man this last week. It was his first time ever to be on camera oh. in his whole life. And he was really nervous. Yeah. I thought he did a great interview for a first time to ever be on TV, but he was just, I, he was fiddling with the chair. And you know, I felt yeah. so sorry for him. I wanted to say, it's just you and me. Don't worry exactly, about anything. Yeah. Just a yeah. conversation, right? Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah, I, I have a lot of that with new actors who come in where they, they fidget. Mm -hmm. uh, they blink a lot. <laughs> They'll move a lot, you know. Yeah. So you gotta get you got to get all those little bad habits out of there and, and make them understand that you are performing and you are in front of a camera and a camera's only going to be like this. And, you know, you might be just from here up. So you've got to really minimize your movement because mm -hmm. it gets a little jittery and a little distracting. Mm -hmm. And those are the things they learn with camera technique how to manage their body and how to manage their facial expressions and things of that nature. So, Wouldn't it be great if we were all taught how to manage our facial expressions <laughs> early on in life? Exactly. Because you know? I know sometimes I get facial expressions that seem to tell my, my thinking. We were doing an art show last weekend and the lady in the booth next to us uh, was setting up but I didn't realize she was setting up she came in and she immediately started moving the tables and I didn't realize she was bringing her stuff through and but I didn't say anything I just went and and she turned around to me and she goes I'm just setting up I'm going to put it back in just a minute I didn't say a word <laughs> just you know by the look on your face, yeah right? and I thought you know what I should have learned how to manage this <laughs> facial expression because sometimes we give it all away exactly exactly and that's 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 the key. Um, you know, camera technique is important. Um, learning how to break down a script, a scene, uh -huh. which is the biggest thing that I work on with them is teaching them that particular system. You know, you have to look at it from the writer's perspective, and um, and really break it down scene by scene. So if you get a if you get a part in a feature film, even if it's an independent film, and you have, you know, there might be 90 scenes in a film. Well, if you're in 20 of them, you have to break down each scene. Because it's not all the same thing. You're dealing with a different character, maybe a different relationship, a different set of emotions, a different set of circumstances. So each scene has to be broken down in and of itself. It's interesting you say that because I try to. I teach art at the university, mm. and I try to teach people how to paint in layers. You okay. know, yeah, yeah. that we're going to paint the background first, and then we're going to concentrate on the next thing forward, and then we will keep building until we get the thing that's closest to you on top. And it's like you get really got to break that picture down. Yeah. It's like breaking down your scenes. You've right. got to break it down and say, what's in the background? What's next? Right. What comes on top of that? What's here? You know, And people have a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like building a character. You, know, you build a backstory. Where did, where did this person grow up? How did they grow up? Where did they go to school? You know, what was, what's, what's been the trauma in their life, if any? You know, that type of thing. Now, the audience may never know that. The director might not even know that. You know? But if it makes you, the actor, feel more connected to the, to the material, then that's a great tool for you to use. Yes. You know, yeah. Build that system up, build that character up, build those layers, as you were talking about, um, whether it's in a painting or in a character that an actor is putting together. You know? Yeah, I like that analogy because I hadn't heard that before to break it down like that. Mm -hmm. and then for me, I had to immediately go, oh, yeah, you can do it like this. You know? yeah. yeah, I had a gentleman on the other day that uh, he's a musician mm. and, and he was telling me that he was in corporate America for years as a, a leader and he was telling me how it compares to now being a musician leading a, a group, a band, yes. and how he uses the same techniques over into this other career of his. Right. And I guess we do that, don't mm -hmm. we? We yeah. use the same techniques in many things. Yep. I was in corporate America myself for many, many years. I worked for two Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I had award-winning sales and all of that stuff. And 
Uh, a lot of that came into just the organizational skills that you learn doing that, you mm -hmm. know. So how do I organize things on a set when I'm directing, right? How do I organize my shot list? How do I organize the band? How do I organize the rehearsal? All of those things. It's really a, a, a you know, a multitasking type of set of skills that really involve being well organized. If you can be well organized and, and do things efficiently, it's going to work a lot better. When I did uh, the last show I did at the Italian American Club, I, I do shows there a couple times a year, and I had uh, the band put together. We never rehearsed, but what I did was I organized the material, I put it on a video, I sent it to everybody. They learned their parts because I only hire great musicians, and there are many here in this town. Oh, boy, do and, we ever have oh, great yeah. musicians. And um, so we got to the setup on the day of the show, and we just ran through about an hour of just tightening things up, and that was it. You know, it's just part of and And a couple of them actually thanked me for doing the video thing. They said, you know, nobody's ever done that with me before, where they sent me a video of, like, the song endings, as an example. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's always the, the big question mark going into a performance. How are we going to end that song? <laughs> you know, so I had done all that in advance, you know, and sent it out. And a couple of them actually came up and, and thanked me for that. I think people really appreciate when you let them know what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, so few people who are in leadership positions actually tell the people they're leading what they want the end result to be. Right, exactly. They tell them how to do the task, but they don't tell them the end result. Yeah. And I think in acting, that's very important. You've got to, you've got to tell them what this character is doing mm -hmm. and and what this character is going to end up accomplishing right. for them to understand it, to do it. Well, there's something in my system that I call the three W's. What do I want? Why do I want it? And what happens if I don't get it? And the actor has to know those things. It's what do I want is my objective. Why do I want it is my motivation. And what happens if I don't get it is what's at stake. Mm -hmm. you know? And you do that with every scene. What do I want? What's my objective? And you have to know that as an actor. You can't, you know, you've got you've to visualize things from the end, yes. so to speak, you know, looking back, you know, start with the end in mind. <laughs> you sound like Stephen Covey. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Or Tony yeah. Robbins. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I asked you a while ago, what was your biggest challenge, but what was also your biggest accomplishment? Um, well, as I mentioned, the accomplishment was you know, getting the, uh, the, uh, the residency yes, at, at the House yes. of Blues. My biggest challenge was just getting there um, to, to, to be able to do that because it took 12 years, you know, because the landscape totally had changed the minute I moved here. Mm. It was a different landscape. So that was a how, did, how did it change? What do you mean? It changed from what to what? Well, the whole four wall thing started to come yeah. into being where you where the four. casino wasn't hiring you to do a show. You had to rent the room from the right. casino. Right. And they're looking at, yeah, come on in. We'll give you, you can do this for $40,000 a week. What? Yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> you know? yeah. And then you so, had to sell your own tickets. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you had to do everything. All the casino was doing was providing you with the real estate. Yeah. You know, to, to do that. I remember and when Jeff Savillico, do you know Jeff? Jeff the name Civilico? is he's, he's quite popular entertainer on the strip, but he's also a keynote speaker, so he mm. travels in the speaking circuit quite a bit. But when he first came to Vegas, this was right about the time they were starting to go four wall. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they said to him. You can do the show, but you got to do it. Yeah. That poor kid was out there fill in that room every day. Yeah. I'm telling you, he went from Bellman to Bellman to Bellman, giving them tickets yep. and going to valet and giving them tickets and handing out tickets on the street just yeah. to fill up that room. Mm -hmm. And he did. He filled it up night after night yeah. after night until finally one of the hotel chains said, oh, let's hire him, you know, and put him in the room because yeah. he was he was doing it all himself. And, and at one point he said to me, I don't even know where I sleep. You know, whoever's got a couch, <laughs> that's where I go. Well, you and, know? and, you know, that's it's hard because in doing all the promotion that you might have to do all day long every day and then per well that's it does that does that affect the performance where's your energy level by the time you have to go on stage yeah you know because performing live requires energy and especially someone like him because he's a um, he's a comic but he's also 
uh, like an acrobatic actor. Oh, really? I mean, he balances a big, huge, like 20 foot ladder on his chin. Oh, and he, you know, and he juggles and he does all these wild things yeah. with his body. And I, I just wonder, where do you get the, the energy left after exactly. being out in that hot sun all day yeah. handing out tickets? Yeah. But he did it until he became real successful. Yeah. That's why the residency at Mandalay Bay to me was a really great thing because they don't have that whole four wall thing. They are hiring you. Yes. So, you know, I had to go in there, prove myself. Uh, they loved what we did. They brought us on board. And, and again, we had that residency for three years um, until COVID hit, then everything changed. So Yeah. How did it change? Uh, well, first of all, they closed, right? Yeah. And then when they opened back up, um, what happened was is uh, House of Blues is owned by... Um, uh, what is it called? Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the parent corporation. But anyway, they're a worldwide concert organization, mm -hmm. Live Nation. Mm -hmm. So Live Nation's worldwide concert organization. When everything hit, they had to cancel concerts all over the world. So financially, you know, they took a huge hit. So instead of uh, hiring groups, bands, they went down to singles and duos, and I can't, I do, I can't do what I do with a single and duo. So yeah. that changed. And then they changed the room. They actually went and remodeled the room. Yeah. So. That's very unusual. Yeah. Yeah, it was an unusual set of circumstances. Yeah. But you managed. Yes. And here still you here. are. Still here. And still. you're still doing it all. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about you that is uh, makes you so unique? You really are unique. What What do you think that is? Wow. That's the, a very interesting question. I, I think that. Well, I think, you know, what, what I think shapes any individual is who's around them, you know, who influences them. Um, you know, the biggest thing for me that shaped my life, a couple different things, was February 9th, 1964. Do you remember that date? That was the Beatles' debut on Ed Sullivan. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't remember that date. So that shaped me a lot. I was um, very young yeah. then. <laughs> yeah, so was I, but it still hit me. Um, and then, of course, you know, as, as I grew older and got married, had children, mm -hmm. my family, um, my wife, just, you know, probably the biggest influence on my life. So um, all of those different factors coming into play uh, sort of chisels out your own personality and individuality. I think everyone is, is unique, you know. Everyone has a unique set of skills. Maybe they don't know what they are at this point in their life or they've never given it a shot, so to speak. Um, but I would say my upbringing, um, you know, the environment I grew up with, how I grew up, uh, all of that um, has created this unique individual that sits here before you that thankfully can do a multiple group of things um, and is quick enough on their feet to, uh, to adjust to unanticipated circumstances <laughs> and un 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 unanticipated questions exactly wow. <laughs> I ask you that because you are um, you, you're very comfortable with you mm -hmm. and uh, did that happen as you grew older did you find that you become more confident and more comfortable with who you are yes but believe it or not it's only happened in the last I'm gonna say actually since I moved here um, because, you know, we artists, so to speak, musicians, actors, singers, whatever, we're, for the most part, we're very insecure people, you know. But, but People don't believe that. No, they don't. Yeah. But it's true, you know. There's the, the whole issue of dealing with anxiety, performance anxiety, that type of thing, and everything else. But it's been, I'd say, the last 10 years or so, maybe 15 years, where slowly but surely things have been calming down internally, right? partly because of age and experience. Um, but I started meditating a lot the last few years, and that's totally changed everything. It you know, helps, I wake up each it? day, yeah, I wake up each day, and I don't get out of bed till I do my routine. And it really, really helps. Um, it helped with my auditions. I used to have to go to LA for auditions, um, and it helped a great deal going in there. The casting directors can smell confidence when you walk in yes, the room. They yes. look for it. So that really made a, a big change in how I approached auditions and things of that nature. So, yeah, that's what I would, I would say. That all of those factors, you know, combine to make this guy you're sitting here with. <laughs> that I happen to like. <laughs> <laughs> that 
Thank you. This has been a wonderful interview. I really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been our great. time went so fast. I can't believe it's <laughs> well, come and good. gone already, you know, because yeah. you're so interesting. I was like, yes, what is he saying? <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. Really, really appreciate it and hope you'll come back again. Definitely, anytime. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Me. Would you like to tell my audience how they can contact you? Yeah, sure. uh, just this mm -hmm. camera right here. Yeah. and. So if you're interested in things like the acting lessons or booking performances or producing films or anything of that nature, you can reach me through my Facebook page. Just go to Paul X Campanella and then just send me a message on Messenger and I'll be glad to answer any questions and uh, help you out in any way I can. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> and thank you for joining us today on What's Your Story? Please come back next week. We'll have another great guest.